Welcome again to Joe Stunner Boxing. Um, Josh Taylor's defeat to Jack Catterall. Um, it means he slips to 19 wins and two defeats. Uh, and the two defeats are back-to-back Teofimo Lopez and Catterall. And if you like me, you feel that he, without question, lost the first Catterall fight. That could be three three fights in a row he's lost. And that is quite a decline for a fighter who, for several years, was viewed as quite an extraordinary talent. He, he, is, he was an extraordinary talent. Uh, this is a guy who, even prior to picking up world titles and unifying an entire division in, in only, whatever it was, 19, 18 fights or something like that. He was beating people like Dave Ryan. He stopped Dave Ryan, who was a very, very tough guy, difficult to stop, um, and knocked out Ahara Davis when he was undefeated. Miguel Vasquez knocked him out when Vasquez was a very, very difficult man to stop. Um and Josh then started collecting belts, you know, Ivan Baranchik and um, Pro Grey. What a terrific fight that was. Won the won the Super Series, the, what is it called? The World Boxing Super Series or whatever it was. Um, picked up the final bit of the jigsaw with Ramirez and looked like he was absolutely on top of the world. There was talk of him going to 147, maybe facing Bud Crawford. Um but suddenly it stopped. Suddenly the this bright shooting star seemed to burn out. And Taylor now at 33, having lost to Teofimo Lopez and Jack Catterall on the bounce, and having had that terrible, terrible gift decision against Catterall in the first fight, you've got to ask yourselves, well, where is he? Where does he go from here? Is there anywhere he can go from here? Um so where did it all go wrong? I mean, well, you know, in order for it to, in order to be a so-called has been, you've got to be someone who it's better than being a never was. And there's no doubt about it that Josh Taylor was was to to cut such a heavy swathe through an entire division and pick up all those belts so quickly. Um, it really was a, a magnificent achievement, but things did start to go wrong. And probably the question is, where where do you go back to? What were the warning signs? Well, I think leaving the McGuigans was, I don't know whether it was the start of the downfall because he actually, when he got with Ben Davison, he actually did continue to pick up belts. He actually became an undisputed champ under the auspices of Ben Davison. But there's no doubt that when he was with Shane McGuigan, Josh Taylor and Shane McGuigan as a working team seemed to be that they that the synergy was absolutely perfect. They seemed to seem to complement each other. And in fact, if you look at an awful lot of fighters that have left McGuigan, Frampton, Carl Frampton's another one, they didn't do a great deal after leaving. You could say that Josh did because he beat Ramirez. He floored Ramirez twice, but that was a very, very close fight. As was the Pro Grey fight. You could actually make a case for Ramirez and Progre winning those fights. They were close, even though against Ramirez, Josh had Josh had him on the floor twice. It was a close fight. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't a great deal in it. Um, and then the Ben Davison thing ran its course. Um, the first Catterall fight, clearly Catterall won that fight. Uh, that remains one of the worst decisions I've seen in my lifetime. Um, he hooked up with Joe McNally, who seems like a Pretty good trainer, you know. Um, I must be honest, I didn't know a great deal about him um, when Josh hooked up with him, but I'd heard about him, I'd read about him. Uh, I read good things about him. and But you've got to ask yourself, maybe Joe has picked up a Josh Taylor that's on the downside of his career. I mean, some fighters do burn extremely brightly. They are shooting stars and they burn out. Wilfred Benitez... There's an example, world champ at 17, and he beat a great fighter in Antonio Cervantes at 17. Uh, amazing. That'll never be beaten, surely. Never's a long time, but um, but by, by his mid-20s, he was washed up. You know, even Mike Tyson. I mean, I, I, think the, I think Tyson started to decline in the first Bruno fight, which was, what was that, 88, 89? I don't know. I mean, Tyson between 86 and probably 88, was an incredible force of nature. 
Um, and he had some, you know, some great tussles, some very, very entertaining fights. You know, the two Razor Ruddock fights were were great fun, and you know, he still not, he still had the power to knock people out. But in terms of technique, um, I felt I feel that he was on the decline quite quite early on in his his career, and and by his, certainly by his late twenties, he you know he's way way over the hill. But but he had the power to continue winning fights, some fights anyway. So. But with the case of Taylor, I think um, I think he is what he does fit into that category of the shooting star type of fighters, the ones that just burn very very brightly and then decline quite quickly. Now we also have to sort of um, mention his lifestyle. Is this a case of Taylor not living the life outside of the ring? Um, if you look at him, it's it's strange, but if you look at him from, say, five years ago, four or five years ago, and you look at him now, in his face, he does seem to have aged. And I don't know if this is his lifestyle, because he does seem to have, he does seem to like a drink, put it that way. He does seem to like partying a little bit um, in between fights. Or is it the fact that he stayed at 140 for too long? Should he, having unified all the belts at 140, should he have moved up to 147? Uh, has he, in a sense, you know, partially wrecked his body by constantly boiling it down to 140 um, in order to take on these fights? If you look at the Teofimo Lopez fight, for four rounds, three or four rounds, he was looking good. It didn't look too bad at all. He was giving T.O something to think about, and certainly in the first three rounds. And then he just seemed to, but after six rounds, he was knackered. And Tio took over and against Jack Catterall. I mean, I thought he looked, he looked decent in pat, in patches. I thought, I mean, Catterall came out with a lot of purpose. He was suddenly, he was jabbing very, very hard to the, to the head and body, trying to take the initiative from Taylor. But Taylor, um, it's not like Taylor was sort of, kept in his box, he was still coming back and, and doing quite well in patches of that fight and and definitely won rounds. I mean, I thought Cattrall clearly won the fight. Um, I think Bob Aram's little uh, hissy fit after the fight was didn't really ring any... It didn't, it didn't really cut any muscle with me, put it that way. I, I thought Cattrall won the fight. But Taylor did win rounds. Uh, and it, it, that indicates to me that the guy's not shot. It's just he's in the wrong weight division. 140. I mean, he's still at 140. And at 33, and as, as we know, you know, the older you get, the more difficult it becomes to take weight off. Believe me, I know. Uh, <laughs> a lot of us know who are way past 40 know. Um, I think he should have moved up to 147 after unifying the belts. But, of course, if you've got those belts, if you've got that status as an undisputed champion – you might want to hold on to that status. Once you give the belts up, you go back to almost go back to square one. But having had that 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 tremendous sort of gravitas of being, uh, you know, being like a Bud Crawford or someone where you've you've, you've won all the belts, um, the next challenge, if he wanted it, would surely have been at one forty seven, where his body would have settled. You know, have a couple of warm up ten rounders to settle your body into 147 and then then go for the champions. I would have thought that would be the way to do it. Um, but he didn't. He stayed at 140. And I wonder if he's if that combined with perhaps not always living the life outside of the ring um, took its toll on Josh's body. So where does he go from here? Uh, it's difficult, difficult to say because I do think he's on the outside looking in now. Whether it's at 140, 147, or whatever, two two defeats on the bounce is not a good look, um, especially to Catterall, who is regarded as a solid fighter, but not internationally a name at all. Teofimo Lopez, all right, that's maybe forgivable. Uh, if he beat Catterall, okay, he's he's still in the game, but I think he's got a long, long way to come back, and I do wonder if he wants to do it. I get the impression that maybe the motivation went having reached that summit, having had a look at the round, having, uh, having, ha having had a look, a look around at all the scenery. I mean, uh, you're on top of Mount Everest. You're looking down at the clouds. You're thinking, I'm here. I've done it. Maybe the motivation went out of him.
maybe it left him. Um, yeah. So what do you think? Do you think Catterall, uh, not Catterall, excuse me, uh, Josh Taylor, do you think he's he's got a a future or is his future behind him? Um, maybe a third Catterall fight? To me, I mean, Catterall's, won, Catterall's winning 2-0 as far as I'm concerned. He's won both those fights. But it, I suppose that's a possibility, a third Catterall fight. If not, then who? If he does move up to 147, who are you going to fight? It's, it's a question that, I just think it's very sad that someone who, who you could argue is, if not the, then certainly we certainly one off Scotland's finest fighters, now finds himself, like I say, on the outside looking in. But what do you think? Give me your opinions below. As always, you know, thank you for your time. I appreciate you watching the video. If you could subscribe to the channel, if you know, and also hit the like button, I'd appreciate that. And yeah, I'm looking forward to reading those comments. Um, so thank you very much. I'll catch you later. Bye for now.